Hello and welcome back to the Alan Kardec USA channel where we discuss the doctrine of spiritism as codified in the writings of Alan Kardec. My name is CISO. Today we will continue with the reading of the book The Astral City, a book written by the Brazilian medium Chico Javier from words transcribed to him from the spirit world by the spirit, Dr. Andre Luis. Okay, so we covered chapters four through eight previously. Today, we will read the next five chapters, chapters nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13. The Astral City book has a total of 50 chapters. Near the end of chapter eight, we learned that Dr. Andre Luis in the spirit world was finally able to leave the hospital known as the Ministry of Assistance in the Astral City and explore the surrounding sites of this fascinating place in the spirit world as he had gone for a walk with his now dear friend and medical attendant from the hospital, Lysias. So let's continue with chapter nine of The Astral City. Captivated by the sight of the magnificent gardens, I asked Lysias to rest with me for a while on a bench nearby, and he willingly agreed. I was filled with a pleasant feeling of peace, watching the graceful sprays of colored water rising in the air, forming intricate patterns. Whoever observes this immense colony of work, I said thoughtfully, is led to inquire about all sorts of possible problems. For instance, the problem of supply. There is no ministry of economy here, is there? That branch of service, answered Lysias, used to assume much greater importance here. Then our governor decided to reduce, as much as possible, the number of practices which might remind us of purely physical phenomena. Therefore, the activities of the Department of Supply were reduced to mere distribution under the direct control of the central administration. As a matter of fact, this was a very important decision. Our records show that a century ago, the colony underwent great trouble to adapt its inhabitants to the principle of simplicity. Many newcomers to the astral city, still struggling with earthly addictions, had insisted on the most extravagant accommodations, including sumptuous meals and stimulating drinks. Only the Ministry of Divine Union, owing to its inherent characteristics, shunned such abuses. The others spent their time overburdened with problems of this sort. Our governor, however, spared no efforts to put an end to the deplorable situation, introducing decisive measures against it the moment he assumed his administrative duties at the Astral City. Some of our older missionaries have told me about that time. They say that the governor requested 200 instructors to come to us from a very high sphere in order to breed new theories about respiration and the absorption of life-giving elements from the atmosphere. Numerous lectures were given on the subject. Many of our own experts were against those innovations on the grounds that because the colony serves as a transition zone, it would be unjust and dangerous to submit newly arrived spirits to such drastic changes. Those from the higher planes believed that such changes could cause serious damage to our patients' spirit bodies. But the governor did not give in. For 30 years, the lectures, illustrative examples, and technical explanations proceeded without interruption. Various renowned spirits went so far as to formulate public protests against the governor's actions. They repeatedly crowded the Ministry of Assistance with patients who declared themselves victims of the deficient new diet. During such crisis, those who were against the change intensified their attack 
yet the governor never resorted to punishment. Instead, he would summon his critics to the government house in a fatherly manner, putting forward the focus and benefits of the new program, emphasizing its superiority as efficient means of spiritualization. For the most stubborn, he would arrange instructive travels to higher spheres, winning over a great number of them. After a long pause, I said, Please go on, Lysias. How did that struggle end? After 21 years of persevering efforts on the governor's part, the Ministry of Elevation gave in and cut its supplies to the strictly necessary. The Ministry of Elucidation, however, took a long time to follow this example, owing to the greater number of statistics-minded spirits working there. They were the most stubborn adversaries, still entrenched in their earthly ideas that the ingestion of protein and carbohydrates is essential to the human frame. They insisted on maintaining those ideas here, and every week they sent the governor lengthy reports, full of warnings and observations, tests and numerical data, supporting their claims. Such rudeness even reached the point of arrogance, yet the governor's patience never failed. Having decided not to act alone, he obtained the assistance of the highly evolved entities who guide us through the Ministry of Divine Union. And together, they examined every one of those documents thoroughly. While the scientists multiplied their arguments and the government stalled for time, dangerous disturbances were brewing in the Department of Regeneration, now known as the Ministry of Regeneration. Some of the less developed spirits there were caught up in the act of rebellion of those in the Ministry of Elucidation and acted simply deplorably. The atmosphere of unrest divided the colony, exposing the astral city to dangerous attacks from inhabitants of the lower zones. Such entities attempted to invade our city, taking advantage of the lack of services of the Department of Regeneration, where many workers had been carrying on clandestine dealings in order to satisfy their undesirable addictions to food. The alarm was given, and though the crisis posed a serious threat to us all, the governor maintained his usual serenity. He asked the Ministry of Divine Union for a meeting, and after listening to our highest counsel, he had the Ministry of Communication temporarily closed. He ordered that the dungeons of the Department of Regeneration prepare for the isolation of the more stubborn rebels. He admonished the Ministry of Education, whose rudeness he had withstood for 30 years, and decreed that any further assistance whatsoever to the lower regions should be suspended until further notice. For the first time in his administration, he had the electric weapons in the city walls turned on so as to emit magnetic darts as a measure of defense. There were neither battles nor attacks on the colony's side, only resolute defense. For over six months, the diet of the astral city was reduced to the life-supporting principles in the atmosphere and the electrical, magnetic, and solar elements in the water. Thus, for the first time, the colony felt the distress of a kind and just spirit. The crisis was finally over. The governor had won. The Ministry of Elucidation itself admitted its error and lent a hand. It is said that during the festivities, the governor was moved by tears, declaring that the general good understanding of his fellow citizens was the dearest reward to his heart. The Department of Regeneration was promoted to ministry, and the city returned to its usual routine. Since that time, only the ministries of regeneration and assistance are allowed greater supplies of nutritive substances, owing to the low spirituality of many of their patients. In all other ministries, the diet is limited to the essentials according to the rules of the strictest moderation. 
Nowadays, everyone agrees that the governor's apparently unpredictable demand was a most valuable measure towards our ascent. Our contact with material things was reduced, giving rise to a greater spirituality. Lysias fell into silence while I pondered deeply over the great lesson I'd just received. Chapter 9 was mostly a discussion from Lysias after Andre Luis had asked some questions. There seems to be a lot to dissect in this chapter. Andre Luis is aware that even though they are in the spirit world, many arriving there still have needs for, quote, material things, unquote. And as a way for the inhabitants to adapt, such things are provided. But there is no ministry handling supplies. He asks Lysias about it, and Lysias tells him that at one time, many supplies were being distributed generously, even to the lower zones. But the governor had put an end to it, and that now only the Ministry of Regeneration and Ministry of Assistance are allowed greater supplies of nutritive substances. Things got so bad that there was worry that the inhabitants of the lower zones would attack the astral city. Kind of difficult to understand how these things could occur in the spirit world. Apparently, if I'm reading this correct, the spirit body does not require food and water. They only think they need it. So it is only provided to those whom have reached the point of being allowed to go through the transition period until those patients one day realize that it's not needed anymore. Noting my growing interest in the processes of nutrition, Lysias invited me to accompany him on an instructive trip. Let's go, he suggested, and see the colony's great reservoir. There you will have the opportunity to see some things that will interest you and to learn the importance of water in our transition settlement. With my curiosity awakened, I gladly accepted the invitation. When we arrived at the corner of the public square, my kind friend stopped. Here we wait for the Airbus, he said. I had scarcely gotten over my surprise when a large vehicle approached, floating about 15 feet above the ground, filled with passengers. It descended like an elevator. I looked at it closely. It was very long, like no vehicle I had ever seen on earth. It seemed to be made of a very flexible material. And judging from the number of antennas on its roof, I guessed that it was connected to invisible wires. Later, when visiting the large working plants of the colony's Department of Traffic and Transportation, I found that my suppositions had been right. Lysias gave me no time for my customary questioning. We climbed in, settled into comfortable seats, and the Airbus started in silence. I felt uneasy in this unusual environment among so many strangers. We traveled at such a speed that I found it impossible to discern the details of any of the structures that we passed. We covered a good distance, stopping briefly every three kilometers, until 40 minutes later, Lysias informed me that we had arrived. The scenery before my eyes was of exquisite beauty. The woods were in bloom and the fresh air was filled with a gentle aroma. It was a miracle of colors and lights. A great river wound its way leisurely between green banks sprinkled with blue flowers. The slow-moving waters shimmering in the sun reflected like a crystal mirror the many shades of blue in the sky. Wide paths cut through the woods in different directions and at regular intervals large trees spread their friendly branches 
offering areas of shade in the sun-bathed landscape. Here and there, fancifully shaped benches invited one to rest. I was simply charmed, and Lysias noticed my enthusiasm. This place is called the Water Park. It is one of the finest regions of the Astral City and a favorite meeting place for lovers. They come here to exchange sweet vows of love and fidelity for their future experiences on Earth. These remarks brought a series of interesting questions to my mind, but Lysias gave me no chance to vent my eager curiosity. Pointing to a large and imposing building, he explained, that is the colony's waterworks. The waters of the Blue River that you see over there are drawn into huge compartments from which they are distributed to every district in the colony. Beyond the grounds of the Ministry of Regeneration, the waters converge again. The river then flows along its ordinary course toward the great ocean of substances, invisible to the earth. As a matter of fact, water here has quite a different density than that on earth. It is much lighter and pure here, almost fluidical. Noticing the magnificent building in front of us, I asked, which ministry controls the the distribution of water. It is one of the rare material activities under the Ministry of Divine Union. Really, I said, at a loss for how to reconcile the two. Lysias smiled and continued with his explanation. On earth, very few people recognize the importance of water. Here in the Astral City, our attitude is different and our knowledge of the subject is far greater. It is obvious that all services that are created need energy and attention to remain in good order. In this spiritual city, we learn to be grateful to the Creator and God's divine laborers for such a gift. Being more deeply acquainted with the properties of water, we know that it is one of the most powerful vehicles for all fluids, whatever their nature. Here, water is used especially for nutritive and medicinal purposes. In the Ministry of Assistance, you will find several departments entirely devoted to mixing pure water with certain elements drawn from solar rays and from spiritual magnetism. In most districts of our extensive colony, the water thus prepared is the basis of our diet. It happens, though, that of all of us, the ministers of divine union have reached the highest degree of spiritualization. Consequently, they were allotted the task of the general magnetization of the water of the Blue River to purify it enough so that it might be used by all of the inhabitants of the astral city. After the ministers of divine union cleanse the water, various institutions carry out the specialized work of endowing it with nutritive and medicinal substances. When the different ducks join again at a distant point opposite these woods, the river flows away from our area, bearing some of our spiritual qualities. I was completely astonished in the face of these explanations. On earth, I remarked, I never heard of anything like this. Humans are distracted, Lysias continued. For many centuries, the sea has kept their environment in balance. Rain has supplied them with food, and the rivers have been vital in the formation of their cities. Water is a blessing in their home and work, and it is the principal and most important element in their physical body. Yet humans go on thinking of themselves as the absolute master of their world forgetting that they are, before any other consideration, a child of the Most High. The time will come, though, when they will follow our example and recognize the value of this divine and precious gift. They will understand that the water in every home absorbs the mental characteristics of its inhabitants. In the physical world, my friend, 
Not only does water carry away the residues of material bodies, but it also becomes impregnated with our mental vibrations. It can be harmful in wicked hands and useful in generous ones. When in motion, its current spreads the blessing of life and acts as a vehicle of divine providence. Absorbing humans' bitterness, hatred, and worries, cleansing their physical home, and purifying their inner atmosphere. Lysias fell into devout silence while I gazed at the tranquil waters that had aroused in my mind so many sublime thoughts. In this chapter, Lysias explains the importance of water, not only as a required substance for the physical body, but as a vehicle of sorts for everything, it seems. The water that surrounds us, he explains, absorbs our bitterness, anger, hatred, worries in every home. We know that all throughout the Bible there is mention of the value of water in our lives. And not just for drinking, bathing, and washing, it seems. Most of the human body is composed of water. There is way more water in the body than blood or anything else. If that's not a sign of how important water is in life, I don't know what is. And this appears to also be the case in the spirit's transitional region, known as the Astral City, where they see it differently and appreciate it even more than those of us here on Earth. Lysias tells Andre Luis that their region is invisible to the people of the Earth. In Allan Kardec's The Spirits Book, in his chapter on incarnation on different worlds, he provides a footnote that speaks of other planets being inhabited. In one sentence, he writes, Mars, as a planet per se, is even less advanced than the Earth, which might be the lower zone spoken about in the book The Astral City, whereas Jupiter is far superior in every respect. Now, we all know that we can't see anything like the astral city on Jupiter or any other planet because we have satellites, powerful telescopes, uh, and robotic exploration missions that have gone there that proves that we can't see anything on there. However, remember what Lysias stated here, that those worlds are invisible to the human eye, to humans on Earth. My generous friend was anxious to show me around the numerous districts of the colony, but pressing duties called him back. You will soon get a chance to visit the different departments of our activities, he said encouragingly. You see, the ministries of the city are vast centers of intense work. A thorough inspection of any one of them would take you several days. However, you will not lack opportunities. Even if I find it impossible to accompany you, through Clarence's mediation, you will be granted a permit to visit any department you like. By this time, we were back at the Airbus, and in a few minutes, we were on our way home. I did not feel again the sensation of uneasiness I had first experienced, nor was I constrained by the presence of the numerous passengers in the Airbus. I was almost at ease and fell to pondering over some of the questions I was anxious to solve. I took the opportunity to question Lysias further. Lysias, my friend, can you tell me whether all spirit colonies are like this one? Do they adopt the same characteristics? By no means. If on the physical sphere, each region, each town presents its own distinctive features, you can imagine the diversity of conditions existing on our planes. Here, as on Earth, creatures are grouped according to the common sources of their origin and the goal in view. 
But it must be remembered that each colony, as well as each of us, stands on a different step of the great stairway leading to perfection. Collective experiences vary among one another. We are only one example of such colonies. According to our record archives, those that came before us often sought inspiration in the work of the devoted workers of other spheres, just as settlements now in formation seek our help. Nevertheless, each organization possessed essentially unique characteristics. As a longer pause in the conversation ensued, I asked, and did the idea of the division into ministries originate here? Yes, it did. The pioneers of the Astral City visited New Dawn, one of the most important spirit colonies near us where activities are distributed into departments. Our founder adopted the system but substituted the word ministry for department, except in the case of the Ministry of Regeneration, which only obtained its promotion under our present governor. Their idea was that the organization into ministries is more meaningful in a spiritual sense. I quite agree, I said. It is important, Lysias continued, that you realize that our colony strongly stresses the principles of order and hierarchy. Merit is the only standard used to evaluate those who may be assigned to, to prominent positions. In 10 years, only four spirit entities have been granted missions of responsibility in the Ministry of Divine Union. As a rule, after long periods of learning experiences and service, we reincarnate to continue our struggle towards perfection. I was completely absorbed in Lysias' words, and he went on. When newcomers arrive showing response to fraternal cooperation, they are housed in a district of the Ministry of Assistance. If, however, they are defiant, they are taken to the Ministry of Regeneration. As they begin in time to improve, they are then admitted as helpers in the services of assistance, communication, and elucidation in order to prepare them for their future tasks on earth. Only a few spirits are allowed the privilege of a long stay in the Ministry of Elevation, and very rare indeed are those who are raised to the staff of the Ministry of Divine Union when positions become available every 10 years. Let me tell you, the things required are no mere expressions of idealistic activity. We are no longer on the physical plane, where discarnate entities are forced to become ghosts. Our time here is spent in active work. The work in the Ministry of Assistance is difficult and complex. In regeneration, it requires strenuous efforts. In communication, it demands a high standard of individual responsibility. In elucidation, it calls for great working capacity and a well-trained mind. While in elevation, spiritual enlightenment is indispensable. As to the missions of the Ministry of Divine Union, profound wisdom and sincere universal love are essential requirements. The government, in its turn, is the busy center of all administrative activities, and numerous services are under its direct control, including nutrition, distribution of electrical energies, traffic, and transportation. In truth, my friend, labor regulations are always fulfilled here. Rest, on the other hand, is also rigorously observed. This is necessary in order to ensure that tasks are fairly distributed. The only exception is the governor himself, who works ceaselessly, even during leisure hours. But does he never leave the government house, I asked? Only when truly necessary for the public welfare. The one exception is his Sunday visit to the Ministry of Regeneration, the zone which contains the largest number of deranged entities, because so many of the spirits there are still on a level with their unhappy brothers and sisters in the lower zones. Vast multitudes of villainous spirits are housed there. Thus, on Sundays, after the collective prayer in the great temple of the government house, our governor spends the afternoon working with the ministries of regeneration on many difficult cases. 
he sacrifices much to assist our distraught and suffering brothers and sisters. We left the Airbus near the hospital where I thought gratefully I would soon find my comfortable room. As we walked, I noticed beautiful music floating through the air. I had first heard the melodies upon leaving, and now as we returned, I looked to Lysias for an explanation. That music comes from our workshops. After long observation, the government came to the conclusion that music stimulates labor. Since then, that inspiring incentive has become an established custom in all our activities. Meanwhile, we had reached the hospital entrance hall. An attendant came forward and addressed my companion. Brother Lasias, you are urgently needed in the pavilion on my right. My friend left with his usual efficient calmness while I retired to the privacy of my room, once more to return to endless guesswork. We learn here in chapter 11 that the inhabitants of the astral city may transport themselves in something called an airbus. Uh, that Dr. Andre Luis describes, a large bus that flies through the air. We also learn of the importance of work. Everyone is assigned duties that must be fulfilled. This, Lysias explains, is how they earn merit, their means of progress and eventually being moved to higher levels. Apparently, the Ministry of Regeneration is where most diabolical spirits moved from the lower zones are kept for treatment. Andre Luis, when he was removed from the lower zone, was transported directly to the Ministry of Assistance, as we saw in the earlier chapters, where a hospital facility is located. He was able to bypass the Ministry of Regeneration because he did not possess those criminal or evil elements. After having received such precious clarifications, I felt most anxious to improve my knowledge of some of the facts Lysias had told me about. His references to spirits in the shadowy lower zones aroused my curiosity. The lack of religious instruction on earth is very often the cause of a serious state of confusion over here. I had heard hell and purgatory mentioned in the Roman Catholic sermons I had attended out of social obligation, but I never had the slightest notion of the lower zone. The next time I met my friendly attendant, I had all of my questions at my fingertips. He listened carefully, then replied. Well now, how can you be unaware of that region when you were kept there for so long? With a shudder of horror, I recalled my past sufferings. Lysias continued. The lower zone begins on the earth's crust. It is the shadowy zone for those who, in the world, turned a deaf ear to the call of their sacred duties, which they failed to fulfill, languishing instead in indecision or dragging themselves into the mire of wrongdoings. You see, on reincarnating, a spirit promises to carry out the mission assigned to him in the Creator's work. Yet, when they recommence their experiences, they find it very difficult to keep their word. Instead, they blindly follow the orders of their own selfishness. Thus, they continue to cultivate old hates and passions, forgetting that hatred is not justice, just as passion is not love. All that is superfluous and useless unbalances the harmony of life. After physical death, great multitudes of obsessed entities remain in that misty region within the earth's physical sphere. A well-accomplished duty serves as a gateway through which we enter the infinite. It brings us closer towards our goal, the sacred union with the Lord. It is natural then that one who neglects the tasks allotted should have the blessing indefinitely displayed. 
Lysias perceived my difficulty in grasping the full meaning of the lesson, owing to my almost total ignorance of spiritual principles, and he tried to make it more objective. Now, suppose that each of us returns to the earth wearing filthy clothing in order to wash it in the waters of human life. Our dirty garment is our spirit body molded by our own hands in our past lives. Although we are granted the blessing of a new opportunity on earth, we generally forget our essential goal. Instead of cleansing ourselves through constructive efforts, we acquire even more stains. We incur heavier moral depths and imprison ourselves through our own actions. We return to the world to rid ourselves of our impurities, knowing that they are utterly inconsistent with the higher spheres. How then can we expect to enter those luminous spheres in an even worse condition? The lower zone is a place where negative mental residues are destroyed. It is a sort of purgatory where the illusions acquired by neglecting the opportunity of an earthly life is gradually burned away. The image could not have been clearer or more convincing. I was simply lost in amazement. Lysias, perceiving how useful these explanations could be to me, went on. The lower zone should be a region of great interest to those still on the physical plane, for it contains everything which is out of tune with a higher plane. Consider how wise divine providence was in allowing the creation of such a plane around earth. There we find compact legions of weak and ignorant souls, not wicked enough to be relegated to colonies of harder times, nor sufficiently virtuous enough to be admitted to higher planes. Those countless inhabitants of the lower zone are close companions to incarnate men, separated from them only by vibratory laws. It is no wonder then that such places are characterized by serious disturbances. There, rebellious spirits of all kinds are grouped together, forming invisible nuclei of extraordinary power, owing to the concentration of their common tendencies and desires. Many people on earth become desperate when the mailman doesn't show up, or when the train is late. The lower zone is full of such desperate creatures who, after physical death, are disappointed at not finding God ready to satisfy their every desire. When they realize that the crown of glory and eternal life are awarded only to those who have worked for it, they show themselves as they truly are, wasting precious time on petty deeds in the lower zone. Just as in the astral city, entities in the lower zone form a spiritual community, but their community is peopled with many different types of frustrated, idle, and perverse entities. It is the threshold, a zone of tyranny and bondage, of those taking advantage of others, and others being taken advantage of. Lysias stopped, and I, greatly impressed, questioned him. But how do you account for this state of things? Do these spirits have no defense, no organization? Organization, Lysias proceeded with a smile, is an attribute of organized spirits. You see, the lower zone to which we are referring is like a home where there is no bread. Everybody complains and no one is right. The absent-minded traveler will miss his train. The farmer who does not plant seeds cannot grow crops. However, of one thing you can be sure, even in the shadows and ordeals of the lower zone, divine protection never fails its inhabitants. Each spirit remains there just the necessary time, no more, no less. And in order to carry out the work of spirit care in the lower zones, the Lord has permitted the establishment of several settlements such as ours. I suppose then, I remarked, that the lower zone must be in close connection with the incarnate plane and even a kind of continuation of it. So it is, he agreed, and you will see 
There, the net of invisible wires connecting it to human minds. It is peopled with discarnated entities and the thought forms of those still on Earth. Every spirit, wherever it may be, is a nucleus of radiating forces which can create, transform, or destroy manifesting as vibrations that earth science cannot yet understand. Thus, whoever is thinking is emitting positive or negative forces and is consequently constructing or destroying something somewhere. It is by means of those mental currents that people establish connection with entities in the lower zone whose tendencies are in accordance with their own. Because every soul is a powerful magnet. You see then that an invisible army is at work. The most strenuous missions in the lower zone are assigned to devoted helpers of the Ministry of Assistance. If a fireman's work in the great cities of earth is exhausting and dangerous because of the blazing flames and clouds of smoke he has to fight, no lighter is the missionary's task in the lower zone. These missionaries have to withstand heavy fluids emitted by thousands of minds obsessed in the practice of evil or terribly punished by redeeming ordeals. I tell you, my friend, a great deal of courage and a superior capacity for self-sacrifice are necessary to be able to help those who are still unable to understand and appreciate the assistance offered them. As Lysias paused once more, I said, Oh, how would I like to work to help those unhappy creatures, to offer them the spiritual bread of enlightenment. My friendly attendant looked at me kindly, and after a few moments of reflection, took his leave with this parting remark. I wonder whether you feel duly prepared for such a mission. A very important note here that Dr. Andre Luis points out at the start of the chapter. Those with a lack of religious instruction on earth is the cause of very severe confusion in the spirit world. Think about how logical that is. If you had religious teachings on earth during the time that you were alive from just about any religion, then you will be able to better understand the situation you find yourself in after death. If you had no religious teachings at all, you're likely to just wander about in the spirit world in a total state of confusion. Lasaya said that the lower zones is a place where negative mental residues are destroyed. It is a sort of purgatory, a sort of hell where the illusions acquired by neglecting the opportunity of an earthly life is gradually burned away. This tells us that even hell, the lower zone, has a purpose. Spirits are being treated there too by enduring the conditions that they are subjected to. In time, those in the lower zone finally begin to realize their faults and eventually become ready to progress to a better state and may leave their purgatory. The Ministry of Assistance has attendants that arrive in the lower zone and practically go through hell themselves, trying to get those suffering souls out of there. It is interesting to note that what Lasea said about how the minds of those entities in the lower zones are connected to the people of the earth and how humans on earth struggle to keep those thoughts of evil and wickedness out of their minds because of that. So in other words, when we have thoughts about doing something that doesn't seem proper or that is not proper, thoughts being transmitted to us by the evil spirits of the lower zones, we should do everything possible to fight it off. Another quick note here before I proceed into the next chapter. The following chapter, chapter 13 of 50, is called 
with the Minister of Assistance. The title of the chapter appears to tell us that Dr. Andre Luis is about to meet one of the ministers of the Ministry of Assistance. Remember from the previous chapters that there are six ministries in the Astral City and each ministry has 12 ministers. As I gradually became stronger, I began to feel again the need for activity and work. Now that those difficult years of distress were over, I longed to begin again the round of occupations which, in the world, generally comprise a regular working day. I fully realized that I had missed excellent opportunities on earth, and that my physical life had been spent along the wrong path. But... On recalling my 15 years of medical practice, I experienced a sense of emptiness in my heart. I saw myself as a strong farmer standing in the middle of a field, hands tied, unable to work. Here I was surrounded by patients, yet not allowed, as before, to approach their beds as their friend, doctor, and scientist. Continual moaning from neighboring rooms reached my ears, but I could not lend a hand, not even as a humble member of the nursing or first aid staff. On the physical plane, it was a matter of studying the regular books plus some necessary training, and one could acquire the rights of a qualified physician. But here, in my new surroundings, spirit doctors employed different methods, their main textbooks being their own hearts, and their basic treatment, brotherly care and love. Even the humblest of nursing attendants in the astral city possessed far greater knowledge and possibilities than I. Consequently, much as I longed for some occupation, I feared that, at least for the time being, any attempt on my part to apply for work would amount to an intrusion upon the rights of others. Faced with such difficulties, I turned to Lysias as a brother. In reply to my doubts and hesitations, he suggested, Why not ask Clarence? He never fails to ask about you, and he is sure to do his best on your behalf. Go and ask him for advice and assistance. I took the necessary steps to obtain an appointment with my generous helper and was told that he would not be able to see me until the next morning when I was to go to his private office. I waited anxiously for the coming interview and very early the following day I made my way to the appointed place. To my great surprise I found three other people already waiting for him. The kind minister had arrived early, long before us, and was seeing to matters even more important than attending to visitors and petitioners. After finishing his most urgent work, the minister had us shown in, two by two. I was surprised at this manner of holding an audience, but was told later that the measure was adopted so that the solution of one case might profit not only the party involved, but also the others present, thus serving the common well-being as well as saving time. After several minutes had passed, I was admitted along with an elderly lady who was to be heard first. The minister welcomed us cordially, putting us at ease to present our requests. Worthy Clarence, began my unknown companion, I have come to beg your involvement on my behalf of my two sons. I can't bear to be separated from them any longer. Moreover, I have been informed that they are leading difficult lives on earth with no end to their misery. I realized that our Creator's designs are loving and just, yet as a mother I can't help worrying and being anxious." The poor woman broke down and wept bitterly. Clarence looked at her with sympathy and kindness, but replied firmly, "'But sister, if you agree that our Creator's designs are holy and just, what is left for me to do?' I should like to be granted the means of protecting my sons on earth myself, replied the afflicted mother. Alas, my friend, said Clarence, in order to protect others, one must have grown in the spirit of humility and service. 
what would you think of a man who, anxious to provide for his little children, remained comfortably at home, never working? Service and cooperation are laws created by God and no one may break them without causing themselves serious damage. Has your conscience nothing to say on this point? How many hour bonuses can you present to justify your demand? The anxious mother answered hesitantly. 304. It is a pity, continued Clarence, smiling that you should have been residing here for over six years and have given the colony only 304 hours of work. Yet, as soon as you recovered from your trials in the lower regions, I offered you a meritorious occupation in the vigilance patrols of the Ministry of Communication. But that was intolerable work, she interrupted. A continuous struggle against malevolent entities. You couldn't expect me to adapt to it. Clarence went on, unperturbed. After that, I found you a place with the Brothers of Support for redeeming service. Even worse, she protested. Those chambers are always crowded with filthy creatures. I couldn't stand their swearing, their immorality, the filth. Realizing your difficulties, continued the minister, I sent you to cooperate in the ward of mental disturbed entities. But can anybody but saints put up with them? asked the rebellious petitioner. I really did my best, but the multitude of raving souls is enough to scare anybody. My efforts did not stop there, proceeded our patient helper calmly. I then placed you in the investigation and research department of the Ministry of Elucidation, but you, sister, probably impatient at my unwelcome interest, deliberately retired to the park of repose. Repose is rest and relaxation, which means that while the woman was assigned to duties at the Ministry of Elucidation, she instead decided to go often to a park for rest and relaxation, repose. Something tells me that her request to go help her children on earth is not going to go well for her. I found that place unbearable, explained the complaining mother. I couldn't possibly endure the atmosphere of strange fluids, exhausting experiments, and harsh supervisors. Remember, my friend, resumed the devoted and enlightened minister that assistance has two inseparable companions, service and humility. In order to help others, we must first obtain the collaboration of helpers, friends, and servants. Before being able to render assistance to those we love, it is essential that we establish currents of sympathy, without which no efficient aid is possible. The peasant who tills the soil earns the gratitude of those who enjoy the harvest. The workman who satisfies demanding superintendents carrying out their orders scrupulously is providing nourishment for his family. The servant who obeys in the spirit of cooperation wins the goodwill of his master, his companions, and all those interested in his work. So you see, no average administrator can ever be useful to his loved ones if he has not yet learned how to obey and serve worthily. Let everybody keep in mind that all useful service belongs above all to the universal giver and that it must be carried out no matter what difficulties or suffering it may cost. After a short pause, he resumed. What then would you do on earth if you have not yet learned how to withstand here. I do not doubt your devotion to your sons, but as it is, you would arrive there as a paralytic mother, incapable of rendering any efficient assistance. To deserve the joy of helping loved ones, we must enlist the goodwill of many of our brothers and sisters, whom we, in turn, have helped. If you give no cooperation, you cannot expect to receive any. That is the law. 
And if you, my sister, possess nothing of your own to give, you will have to turn to others for voluntary contribution. But how will you obtain it when you have not sown anything, not even good feelings? Go back then to the park of repose where you have been residing lately and give the subject serious attention. We shall take it up again. The disappointed woman sat down, drying her tears. The minister then looked at me and said kindly, Your turn, my friend. I rose hesitantly and approached him to present my request. In this chapter, we first learn of the Our Bonus System used in the Astral City to earn merits. That system will be explained better in a future chapter. So the minister that Dr. Andre Luis went to see was Clarence, the same man who helped him leave the lower zone. However, Andre Luis did not get a chance to speak because Clarence had allowed a woman to go first. Clarence made it clear to the woman that she is in no position to help her children on earth who are miserable because she hasn't shown the ability to help others in the astral city. And to put it simply, at the moment, she is totally incapable of providing any help to anyone as demonstrated by her decisions. That was the end of chapter 13. That will complete the readings of the Astral City for today. Please be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you are alerted when the next video is uploaded. You may also share your comments below, or if you would like to write to me personally, I can be reached at cardecusa at gmail.com. My name is CISO. Take care and have a blessed day.